everyone uh, joining us from uh, Australia and good evening to everyone joining us from New Zealand. My name is Mayank. I'm the Regional Manager for Australia and New Zealand at TerraView. And welcome to today's webinar. The topic for our discussion today is to know your yield, which is a million dollar answer. I don't think it requires a lot of introduction to all the panelists as well as uh, all the attendees today why knowing uh, your yield is a million dollar answer, especially in a season like this where you not only have geopolitical variables playing out, but you have the seasonality playing out. You have the weather uh, swinging in from a very uh, uh, humid kind of a, a situation starting out, in, especially in Southern Australia and parts of uh, New Zealand at the beginning of the season to now moving towards a sunny uh, temperament. We're seeing flowering breaking out uh, across parts of uh, multiple varietals. And as we enter uh, the last uh, leg of this season over the next uh, 8 to 12 weeks, we're expecting uh, this season to kind of close out and hopefully enter a better uh, uh, business uh, from both last year's yield as well as the year before the yield uh, across Australasia. Uh, today, in terms of our panelists, we have uh, Pratik joining us. Pratik is currently based out of Barcelona. He's the CEO and co-founder at TerraView. Uh, Pratik's been on this journey of entrepreneurship for the last uh, decade, having built and uh, sold uh, two companies in the past. He's uh, been chasing the uh, uh, uncertainty of uh, vineyard management for the last three years, and uh, it is his vision that uh, has shaped uh, Terabi into what it is today. Uh, I also have Clayton and Mark joining us from uh, Tamberlane. Uh, Clayton uh, runs the show with regards to the vineyards at Tamberlane, uh, which is among Australia's leading organic wine uh, brands. And Mark, of course, requires no introduction. He's a legend in the field of uh, winemaking and viticulture across uh, Australia. Uh, we'll also shortly be joined by Dr. Jordan. Dr. David Jordan has been a viticulture practitioner for nearly three decades across uh, Australasia. He's uh, based out of New Zealand and uh, uh, joins us with regards to uh, sharing a viticulturist perspective on what goes into making of a yield. Our intention today is to cover three separate perspectives and to see what could be the best way to arrive at a solution. We have uh, Mark and Clayton sharing with us the winery and the wine label perspective on what goes into making of a yield, what are the factors, what are the challenges. And what are the gaps that go into the uh, current solutions uh, that are available in the market? Uh, Pratik shares with us the TerraView perspective, which is a technology platform-led perspective about how complex is it with regards to solving the yield estimation problem and what are its repercussions across the entire value chain of winemaking. Uh, Dr. Jordan, of course, shares with us the viticulture's perspective. What is the scientific challenge that goes into making of yield? What are the various factors that affect it? And why does it vary so much across regional, uh, across regions, across seasonality, and across different varieties? Uh, Dr. Jordan, all yours, if you want to present your screen. Thank you very much for the opportunity to address you all today. And it, as uh, Mayan said, the topic of today around yield estimation is something that um, is all very close to our hearts and to our bank balances when it, and its impact on operating vineyards. So what I'd like to do is go through my presentation, which I'll share the screen here now. And apologies for being uh, slow to connect today and I appreciate your patience. Mm -hmm. And as fate would have it. You've seen, look, now we're underway now. So thank you. Obviously a few technology glitches on a technology subject, which is always an interesting way to start. So my presentation today really is focusing around yield estimation, where we are now uh, and why we should focus on it and where we could look to in the future to improve the way that we approach our yield estimation. And the areas I want to cover is, and I've used the term hi-fi in the title for my presentation, and I'll come back to why I've used that term. And it's, it's with consideration for what we're looking for from our approaches with yield estimation. And what we've got in our near future is the opportunity to use 
I think refined and continually be refined uh, technology in the space of machine learning, which will provide many benefits to us with improved efficiency, looking to get um, enhancements of productivity in the vineyard. And then uh, what I think we as mere mortals are starting to struggle with now is just the opportunity to actually comprehend and, uh, uh, and deal with what is becoming increasingly more complex data sets. How do we actually bring all this information together in a form that can be utilized in a, in to make for clear management decisions? So we'll develop that in, in some discussion. So first things first, just to recap, and this may be uh, for many of you sort of um, just focusing on things that you already know, but I think we'll bring it down to a couple of key examples of why yield estimation can be very beneficial and important to you and your, your vineyards. And then at the end, look at the possibilities of similar technology that has now been presented to us as an opportunity and how it could actually play out in, the, in other areas of our vineyard management, that of irrigation and disease and pest control. So this concept of hi-fi, and I think many of us probably um, are of the right age and, uh, and, and memory of the introduction of hi-fi that came into the sound and, and the way that we experienced music. And really what that provided us was the opportunity to get greater precision in the music that was provided to us that also involved the role of electronics, so new technology. And I think when looking at new uh, opportunities within the space of managing vineyards, I think that's part of our desire. We're looking to actually, and it's been demanded of us from all angles, that our vineyards are now demanding us as vineyard managers for greater precision. So we're looking for more higher fidelity in the way that we're managing our vineyards, whether that be as a contract grape supplier, or if you're supplying grapes through to an associated winery. And, and what I think today's webinar will help us understand that technology exists and is rapidly development, developing that can provide us greater high, and more or higher fidelity in the way that we manage our vineyards. So yield estimation is critical and, and we need accurate or as near accurate information throughout the growing season about the yield that we are managing. And I think this plays out in many, many ways that we see commercial benefit. And the one example I'm going to talk to is about yield management. So if you've got yield targets, how you go about accurately and precisely managing the yield for a particular commercial outcome. When it comes to resource allocation, understanding the yield and the potential revenue that you have on your vineyard uh, dictates the type of resourcing that you allocate to either within the vineyard or the whole vineyard. So understanding the yield helps with that. And when it comes to financial planning, yield be one of the critical drivers to the revenue from your vineyard. Understanding the yield throughout the, the growing season helps with your financial planning. Gives you advance warning of the yield and the likely revenue that you're going to be generating from your property. When it comes to the winery and the understanding of yield and forewarn being forewarned about the yield that's going to be delivered to you and your winery, really helps prepare for processing capacity and coordination of our harvest plan. When it comes to allocation of grapes to particular wines within a portfolio, understanding the yields are likely to be generated from the supplying vineyards is very critical to your planning. Then in advance of receiving the grapes, having the right resourcing within the winery, whether it be staff, barrels, and other pre-planning uh, it really pin, pin, the yield and the likely supply volume uh, plays out in so, in so many ways. And then looking at the whole wine business, just preparing and planning for a sales and marketing plan. And then when it comes to that allocation of grapes, understanding the, as early as possible, the likely production volumes going through a winery are very important. And as I said, one of the key drivers to both the vineyard and the winery is the yield of grapes that are delivered. Or, or supplied and delivered and driving the revenue of both those businesses. So just looking at a couple of examples to emphasize why yield estimation can be, uh, can be very critical to you and your vineyard. And, and one example I want to highlight here is if you've got well-defined 
wine quality targets that are dictated by the yield from your vineyard. And if they're agreed with either the winery you're supplying or your uh, a a co contracted under some strict terms, managing the yield precisely uh, is part of the agreement. To manage that yield, you need to understand what is the yield you're likely to generate. And having an accurate estimation of the yield prior to taking any action to manage the yield is, is critical. And take, for example, you've predicted the yield and the actual yield comes in higher than what you pr projected. You uh, potentially, sorry, the other way around, if your actual yield is higher, sorry, is lower than what um, you are predicting, you run now the risk of removing more crop than you, you uh, would ideally want to do. Also, then you undershoot in so many ways. And the reverse, if you underestimate the yield that's out there and don't take enough action, uh, they are, the yield is greater than what you expected and the wine quality suffers. And you can see the yin and the yang on, on uh, unders and overs uh, and getting uh, the lack of precision in the process. So really placing uh, huge demands on yield estimation for your ability to deliver a yield to a target. The other example I was going to highlight, and that is really around the relationships we have with wineries if we're a contract grape supplier. But being able to provide accurate yield estimates, estimates in advance really helps with building that partnership with our client winery. Communicating accurate yields drives the expectation and manages it through. So there's no surprises when it comes to harvest about the amount of yield that's on the vineyard. You're not sitting there with either bins or trucks, uh, more than you need for the yield that you're going to be harvesting, or equally embarrassing to have a higher yield than what you were projecting and now being under capacity to be able to deliver the grapes to the winery. And, and I'm, I'm sure many of you can think of other examples of where understanding the yield um, has created challenges during harvest, part pick blocks, uh, yields, uh, that have triggered yield caps and creating very uncomfortable discussions with your contracted winery about what we're doing with the uh, uh, yields that are higher than what they're expecting and talking about the potential downgrade of the grapes that have been supplied. The other side of that equation is also from a risk management for you as the owner or manager of the vineyard in that if you understood that yield was running higher than what you expected, it has a direct impact on the likely harvest date. So high yields, protracted harvest, increasing the risk of, uh, with the extended time on the vines, of loss of fruit condition, maybe the challenges again of getting a coordinated harvest and getting the grapes off in, in a timely fashion. I think with the importance of yield estimation, Many of us have undertaken many approaches to estimate the yield. Uh, still applied to this day, the quick guesses either from the seat of the tractor or the ute or the motorbike as you pass through. And that quick guess I've sort of labeled as iometry, you know, based on either his historic experience or visual assessment of how big the, or small the crop looks like. And that may be the figure that you put in your notebook or communicate to your winery. In more recent times, it's been quite extensive effort and quite labor intensive efforts regarding collecting data and monitoring the vines, whether this be bunch counts, berry counts, bunch weights estimated, to build up a calculated yield estimate for the vineyard. And sometimes this is colored through the historic information you have over many years to guide and get the best estimate. Too often, these estimates are well off the mark, and I'm, I'm sure many of you have had that experience where variation around your estimates can be not 10%, but 20 or 30% uh, have an error associated with the actual harvest. They're labor intensive and often not delivering the accuracy that we're after. Now looking into the future, and maybe some of you are, are practicing these already, there are a number of approaches that have been evaluated to try and enhance and improve the way that we, we perform our yield estimation in vineyards. 
there are uh, vine physiologists that are building up whole vine models that understand the responses of climate and conditions and site and how it translates through to the yields that are generated by vines and you can multiply it up to the yield from a vineyard. In recent times, we're now seeing the uh, uh, availability of technology that we can either create images of the vines and the bunches either close up to the vines in the vineyard or some near range image where there be cameras attached to drones or far range and using satellite images to enable the ability to predict the likely yield. These uh, are being talked about for a number of years and we're seeing progressively more of this technology and the utilization of images coming through as opportunities to provide yield estimations for our vineyards. One of the difficult aspects of all this new te technology is they're often based on huge amounts of data and the ability to try and bring all the information together into some usable form that enables us to interpret and then make management decisions. That's critical and places a lot of demands on the opportunities of this technology. So getting back to the high fidelity and the opportunities that are presented in this space, I'm observing a lot of other industries are well ahead of our uh, grape and wine industry in the adaption or adoption and then application of improved technology when it comes to the operation of their uh, businesses. We are fast catching up and I think today's forum is fantastic to give us a chance just to contemplate what is a, an, an opportunity in the space. And, to see how we can improve the way we manage our vineyards and our wineries. Just as I observe these opportunities, we are being bombarded by a whole range of options. And one thing I've, I guess is a word of caution and maybe uh, the risk of being distracted is often I think we always get attracted to the new device, the new piece of machinery. And many of you will be following the road of uh, role of potential robots and other uh, tool car carrying devices that might be able to better automate many of our vineyard tasks. But when you look at a lot of this technology, it, it is very attractive. We, get a, we often get distracted by it, but it has often a very high price tag. So there's a lot of money up front. We are dealing with very early developments. And so there's a high risk with some of those. Uh, also the amount of time it takes to evaluate the devices is, is uh, puts a burden on us to evaluate and often we don't quantify that as a true cost to our business. And also going forward, there are often high operating and repair and maintenance costs and then depreciation. So the financial burden on our business can be quite significant. And I think there's a risk to getting um, captured by these opportunities and sort of missing some of the other um, uh, technology opportunities that are on offer to that could provide us um, similar benefits at a lower cost. So I think there's some real opportunities and we're demanding uh, improvements in the way that we uh, approach our yield estimation to gain efficiencies and also the, the, I think the real opportunity to gain accuracy. So what if we could get an 85 to 90% accuracy of our yield estimates without having to go out and count a single berry or, or bunch? Uh, I think many of us would jump at that opportunity to get something that accurate that would provide that. Also, if it's delivered in a form that enables us to easily review and regularly update. So we're getting constant updates on how the yield is tracking from an estimation point of view. Also, one of the challenges with many of our existing approaches with berry, bunch and other counts is that we are limited by the number of sample vines to um, improve the quality of those estimates. So if we can get an estimate that captures the whole of vineyard and all the variations that exist within the, within the vineyard, that would enable us to get a more accurate out, uh, outlook for the yield from our vineyards. And also if it's presented in a form that enables us to communicate what we believe the estimated yield to be, whether it be to the owners of our vineyards, to the wineries that we're supplying grapes, or the client that's buying grapes from our vineyard. And the ability to then integrate all the information across a range of inputs. 
real-time monitoring so we're not dealing with just a single assessment constantly updating on depending on how the weather or other factors are playing out and how that could impact on the yields presented in a form that gives us a rapid and quick visualization of the yield that we're dealing with and takes into account the role of soil the vines and their their uh, configuration the climate that's been to date and also uh, any forecast weather events that could impact on the yield and the other thing is to bring in the factors of zonal differences. So there's a real opportunity to enhance what we presently have in access to yield estimation. So I believe we've got these opportunities are starting to be presented to us to enhance the way that we get yield estimation. And the way that we're going to um, come to accept and understand the opportunities is effectively embrace some of this technology that's been presented whether it be in yield estimation or other opportunities to give us benefits across the board, including harvest optimization. Then, and to reiterate the, the risk that many of us face is, you know, where do we apply our review and evaluation of all these opportunities that are presented to us and not be distracted by the shiny new piece of hardware or the new tractor or the new tool carrier, but actually investigate more broadly about the role that technology could play out in the way of our yield estimation. And the other thing is also to have an open mind and an acceptance that much of this technology is moving very quickly. It's adapting to continue to enhance and improve the delivery of, of the role that it plays. And our ability to adapt and grow with this technology will mean that we're more receptive at every step to actually be you know, ahead of the game and operating with the future because it is now. So with that, I'll conclude my presentation and thanks for the opportunity just to recap on the role of, and the critical role of yield estimation and some of the sort of future opportunities that are now being presented to us. Thank you so much, Dr. Jordan. Uh... For all the members in the audience, if you have any questions, you can put them on the Q&A section and we'll take them at the end of the session. And uh, with that, I would like to bring on stage uh, Mark and Clayton. Uh, we would love to hear a perspective from a winery's uh, point of view. Uh, yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Pratik, thanks, David. Uh, well done on the presentation, mate. It's good to see you after a long time. I wish Orange was looking that, that vivid in the background here at the moment. We'll bring it in, you know, I'm by a fair bit of water and rain at the moment. So yeah. um, just a bit of background on Tamburlaine. Uh, it was uh, founded in 1966. It's a very, very rapidly growing company in the organic industry, which now puts us at probably the largest organic producer in Australia. Um, We've got multiple vineyards across the Hunter Valley and the Orange Wine regions, 50 plus hectares under management in the Hunter Valley now, 700 hectares in the Orange and surrounding regions, um, with a vast majority of that being certified organic and biodynamic. Uh, and we've uh, taken possession in the last 18 months of a 10,000 tonne winery based uh, around Orange. So we've basically centralised all our production uh, in the Orange region in New South Wales now. Um, at the moment, uh, we, we probably spent 12 months looking for a platform um, to get yield forecasting, um, NDIV as far as infrared technology, mapping vineyards and trying to help us understand the vineyards uh, better going forward so that we can get more accurate yield predictions. Um, and, and as David said earlier that you know, 25% seems to be you know, a standard acceptable tolerance as far as, far as yield estimations go. Um, we still have to send a person out to do the counts to get 25% variation. So if, if that can be brought to 85, 90, or even plus 90% without having to send someone out, that's a big difference uh, as far as the money saving goes and, and cost, uh, cost structure. Um, the other thing that we, we're interested in is TerraView's AI platform on how it's evolving. Uh, we're constantly getting updated yields all the time as far as a company 
we need to be looking at as a, we're a demand driven company. So we need to look forward and when working out where our sales are headed, what varieties that we need, um, and then we have to go and try and source those. So we rely extensively on yield forecasts to know where our deficits are. Um, one of the things I suppose, as far as yield estimation scale we have with contract uh, growers, and I suppose a lot of the wineries out there will understand this, is that when contracts are up, growers, growers will tend to come back and go, well, we, we want some more money for our grapes. And typically they, you know, you'll hear why, well, it's because that our yields have gone down. Well, when we start looking at them, you actually find out, and David will probably be aware of this, that you know, during the 90s, it was a vast planning. There was a lot of uh, disease vines go through. And we're starting to see the end result of that now with your typer and botrosphere take, taking uh, uh, control in the vineyards. Now, when we talk to growers, we would uh, say to them, what's your economic threshold for actually pulling those vines out? And they might come back and go, well, you know, 8 10%. Well, if we put the drone over and do, do a bare arm assessment on the, on the vines, we actually find out that your type can be up to 50% of that vineyard. So straight away, that 50% is an unproductive area. So when you're basing yields on standard 10 tonnes per hectare, before the season begins, you're at five tonnes per hectare. Then you've got to take into account seasonal variability, rainfall, hail, frost. So we need to be able to have that evidence to go back to the grower and go, well, your yields have gone down, not, not because of the way you're growing, it's because of the disease you have in the vineyard. You set your target at 10%, you're actually at 50%. So you've gone over your threshold, but you didn't know because no one had ever told you. So that's where, that's where the Terabue platform, as far as the satellite imagery or the drone imagery, will come into playing back and helping the, the vineyards and the wineries to better understand their vineyards. Um, some, sometimes, uh, I know what David was saying a minute ago, uh, you, you can have the problems with over yields. Um, sometimes for a winery, especially with products like Sauvignon Blanc and Pinot Gris, at the moment where it's very tight on supply, it's not a bad thing for us where a grower can come back and, uh, and say to us, well, you know, we've got excess fruit out there. Do you want it? Yes, well, of course we want it. We'll negotiate on price, but we've got to make sure it's a it's a win-win for both parties where you know, we, we get it, they're happy, we're happy, and we've got some product in the bank going forward because the next season could possibly be a bad one. So we need to have a little bit in the bank going forward just to buffer us a little bit. Um, and also, you know, if the season starts to go downhill um, as far as the red supply goes, we, you know, we can always look forward and pull, pull the reds in early for rosé base. But at the same time, you know, there's a point where we don't need you know, too much rosé sitting in the bank because it's still a product we have to sell. But we try and work out, work out uh, the best scenario with growers. If things do go downhill, we do have vari uh, variability as far as elevation goes, where we're taking fruit from 300 metres right, right up to 900 metres above sea level. So if the 300 metre vineyard suddenly get a, a deluge of rain and it starts to fall off towards the end of the season. Yes, we can take those reds in early for rosé, and then we've still got three or four weeks left in the high vineyards to still pull, pull good table bread in after that. Uh, so that's sort of where we're up to with Terraview, but I'll let Mark talk about sales and forecasting and how that ties back in with the winery and then the yields going into the winery and out the other side as far as a demand perspective. Thanks, Clayton. Uh, David's uh, summary was enlightening. It was a, it was a really good uh, review there and it led you to ask all the right questions, I think. Um, I think uh, our industry, particularly viticulture, is lagging behind, as he points out, in terms of adoption of technology. I mean, a, a lot of it's out there. It's just the rate at which we're taking it up. Um, I. Clayton referred to the concept, and I noticed in David's uh, uh, presentation, uh, I was interested in the position of sales and marketing in the list of activities, because to me, Tamburlaine is, and I, I think a lot of wine companies now have to be much more sales driven than supply driven. And so this makes this so economically critical. 
that you know what you as best as you can you can monitor what's out on that, those vineyards by variety with greater and greater with with real act, real time accuracy um, the closer and closer you get to harvest um, we supply a market the market expects a range of products and those products if, if all of a sudden they're not on the shelves then they could disappear completely from that retail outlet. So, so this concept of, of knowing what's on the vine uh, and assessing and reassessing constantly. Uh, I like his term about iology. I've lived in 37 years with an iology approach to, to assessing uh, what out, out in the vineyard. And I know that so many of us are guilty of pulling up, you know, pulling up at a vineyard popping out at the same spot every time we go there, walking a few panels in, making our assessment and walking out again. I, and I, look, you know, I don't blame anybody because vintage and winemaking and business of winemaking is, is bloody bus busy and vintage is busy. And it's very easy just to accept the last notion you had about what was happening in the vineyard, what yields were there, uh, and, and just make your assumptions on the base of that. Um, and, and from a business point of view, that's hazardous, that's risky. And from a logistics point of view, there could be a lot of money wasted in terms of planning for X amount to arrive or having to truck X amount that when in fact it's not there or having to, having to cater for more suddenly when there's more there. I mean, this is such a, a financially, um, it's, it's, a, it's such a, a, an expensive business. And to be, to be well planned and well organised the best you possibly can in a chaotic, busy period for people in the industry uh, is absolutely critical. The other thing I'd say is that, you know, photography, photography and, and, and uh, rapid collection of photographic and visual images is part and parcel, it's passed around on the internet all the time. We, we must, we should be making much better use of that sort of technology so that people don't have to run around. I mean, I don't know about smaller producers who maybe have a vineyard out behind their winery, but I'm talking about uh, producers where they're having to draw from a number of vineyards and they want a first hand understanding of where that vineyard's up. But to get there, just to drive around our vineyards in Orange and Cowra, it takes all day. And that's not even doing it properly. So the time that is involved by a key winemaking staff to go out there and physically do their limited, their limited and cursory assessment of what's going out and talk to the guys who are running the vineyard is, is very time consuming in a life that's very busy. And, and so that's, to me, it's a waste of, if we've got better technology, let's use it. The, and, and if the other thing is, uh, I would just want to refer to selective memory, because I, I think that what this is to do with your perceptions year on year about how vineyards are performing. I think we have a very poor uh, retention of, of, and I think we go out to vineyards and we, we say, oh, is it better than last year? Is it worse than last year? It's very much based on our, our best, uh, the best performance of our memory and the way in which we hold that data in our head. That's been tradition in the iology department. And, and it seems to me that uh, we're not very good at it. So to have a platform where real data is collected and you can accumulate that over a period of time. And you can even go back to similar years and have a look at what was what was happening at that time in the year. I think that's what technology provides us. That's what we should be using. Um, there's loads of loads of gimmicks and, and things and early adoption, as David pointed out, can be expensive. But but the fact is the technologies just to have a platform where we can collect data and collect collect photo, photographic images of vineyards. Um, and, and accumulate that data and, get, and then use AI to accumulate information to better predict what, what's going to be impacting our business at every vintage. Seems to me to be absolutely critical. Tamburlaine's a growing business. It's, uh, it, it really wants to know what's out there and wants to review that for everybody in the supply chain, right up to the point of, of, of picking, harvesting the grapes. So from our point of view, We've been looking at this and technology possibilities for quite some time. And, and that's why we've come to TerraView as, as seemingly one of the leaders now in, in, what, in what they're providing to the market. 
uh, uh, in, and we, we we're really interested to continue, well, to go forward to utilise the technology and any other technologies which will help us be a better business, a better wine business. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, I have two questions, but I'm going to save them, uh, one each for you and one for Clayton. Uh, but I'm going to save them for the end of the session before I bring up uh, Pratik next. Uh, but uh, a fantastic summary of why it is important for uh, us to move beyond ideology and uh, get a sense of a more objective uh, uh, visualization of what is going on in the platform, not for just the immediate season, but for what happens after that. Uh, on that note, I'll bring up Pratik uh, to share the third angle of this puzzle, which is what's the technology part of solving a very complex problem like yield uh, our understanding of the uh, expectations that industry has, and we'll try to address some of the open points from both Dr. Jordan's conversation, as well as uh, something that both Clayton and uh, Mark brought up. Uh, Pratik, over to you. Thanks, man. Thanks, Clayton and Mark, and thank you, Dr. Jordan. An excellent uh, sort of overview and presentation. So, quickly sort of run through mine. Then we can see my stream. Okay, excellent. All right. So, over 700 million people uh, consume wine today across the United States and Europe. And there are another about 300 million odd consumers in Southeast Asia, in, in Australia, South America. Now, by, by 26 or 27, expecting over 20% of the world's population will be consuming wine, making it the most consumed beverage after water. Global wine market touched almost $400 billion in sales this year. Uh, it, almost 50 billion bottles were sold, but instead of celebration, what's the most important thing on each one of the 180,000 wine producers across the world? It's yield estimation. Hello, everyone. My name is Pratik. I'm the co-founder and CEO of TerraView. We are an early stage startup and we're building an operating system for wine. Our mission is to increase the GDP of wine and make it a carbon neutral trillion dollar industry. When we started our journey, we spent a lot of time you know, speaking to wine producers globally. And you know how many came up with yield estimation as one of the top two uh, problems? It's 90%. Almost every one of the 600 wine producers that we have spoken so far listed accurately listeners amongst the top two problems that they need to solve. A lot of them told us that their own yield estimation methods are working for them for decades and that climate variability is probably one of the biggest reasons why the accuracy has taken such a hit. Quite a few of them were doing a lot of experiments like we sort of heard today uh, to solve this. They were adding hardware, doing drones, some are doing more frequent counts, someone trying to work with academy or research bodies to get a solution. But what do you think was the percentage of wine producers from this set of 600, which were able to attempt a solution? Now, success or failure is a matter of sort of very many, many moving parts. But what was the attempt percentage? 30%. Why only 30%? If the problem is for 95%, why only 30% made an attempt to experiment? Three big reasons. First is trust. Now, data is an important input in helping build a solution. And ev not everyone was comfortable during, you know, sharing a lot of data before any system or tool proved itself to be useful. Producing wine is a very, very intensive process. There is very little time at the hands and any additional tool or task that takes in or requires an additional time commitment until there is trust just doesn't work for the wine world. So most ended up in-house experiments uh, to save time and keep their data secure. Second big reason was, was the history. So wine industry has its recent history with technology. It has been slow to adopt, but that's not just because they're a cautious lot, that they are, but it's also because a lot of them have discontent with technology. Quite a few of them were sold drones, you know, expensive hardware, robots, and whatnot, claiming that it will solve for their problems, but none ever did. Tools were clunky, they were harder to train, very hard to operate, and importantly, these tools would never talk to each other. So many wine producers ended up with 
you know, five or seven pieces, different pieces of hardware. They were running 10 different apps and none of these tools ever spoke to each other. In the end, it all became an exercise of taking data from each tool or app and then putting it in an Excel and just doing your own analysis. Third and the most important reason was the absence of truth. Wine is the most traveled food product. For a consumer, wine is a global product. You can enjoy an Australian wine in India, Singapore, and even Spain. Its reach transcends borders. However, while the produce is global, the production is fiercely local. Any solution which is divorced from the terroir will never deliver the results. Wine producers have always had to struggle with this simple truth never getting captured by solution creators. When we learned of all of this, we knew that we had to build our solution with three things at the center of it all. First being to build trust. Second, we had to learn from the history. And third, input absolute truth. So what did we build? Our solution is built like a home appliance. We wanted zero friction for our customers. We wanted to reach a state where we build trust by respecting time and data of our users and asking for only what is needed. Our platform today requires only 60 minutes to get started. And that is the time our users spend on providing one-time details and of our vineyard and historical data. We use the next 48 hours to set up the platform, bridging it and sometimes augmenting it with true signals. And within seven days of coming on board, our users get weekly updated deal estimates. The platform also provides knowledge of how it arrived at those estimates. It allows you to input your feedback and observations on the ground and do a very easy comparison and even download information making your estimates unique and personal to your TerraWare. Requires no special hardware, no special training to get started on TerraView to know your yield. So what's been our scorecard? Now we wanted to get tested at scale. So we ran an yield estimation for over 100 wine producers in the Northern Hemisphere, not only in Spain and United States. They used TerraView to estimate yield. In US, we were 85% accurate. In Spain, we were almost 90% accurate. In some cases, we were close to 98%. These are some of the wine producers who partnered with us and today are satisfied with what they got by trading only one hour of their time. Today, we operate over 20,000 hectares of vineyards across the world. We work with over 150 wine producers and uh, they're currently using our platform. And today, we add one wine producer to our platform every day. In, by 2022, we expect that over 1,500 wine producers across the world would rely on TerraView's yield estimation to make critical decisions of their business much in advance. For the wine world, having accurate yield estimates today are far more important than ever. And the reason for that is because the climate has changed. Climate change is inevitably changing the way we produce food, the effect of which are already being felt everywhere. And special foods, are the ones showing very early sign. Wine is right at the top of special food chain and it's like the canary in a coal mine. Today our climate is hottest and wettest ever in recorded history. In the wine world, we've seen increase in wildfires, droughts, frost, and many such climatic incidents in a highly accelerated manner over the last five years. And the next two decades are going to be a big climate test for us and our businesses. Over the next decade, we won't be able to grow all that we need the same way, at the same time or even at the same place. So time, place and methods, all three will undergo transformation. It will change, it will adapt and it will improve. And wine producers are going to feel the impact long before we feel that in retail stores. So how are you building for climate challenge? Production is at the core of wine business. If there is no production, there is no distribution, there is no capital. And yield estimation is at the core of production. All the aspects of business like insurance, capital, distribution, procurement, labor, disease, nutrient, all have yield estimation as an input or an impact. We are building yield estimation and all the other tools at the intersection of climate, viticulture knowledge and technology to help drive predictability and certainty. The rain is coming. And TerraView is the arc that we are building before the rain. But we can't do it alone. And we won't do it alone. We need every wine producer to help us build. Some of them have already shown trust in us and we are committed to solving for them and for the entire industry. 
Thank you very much for your time, everyone. Enjoyed speaking today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prati. Uh, what I would like to do is uh, get Dr. Jordan, Clayton, and Mark, uh, all of you, uh, to kind of have a conversation. And I want to instigate the conversation by asking the question that I had been meaning to ask Mark earlier. Uh, Mark, uh, you've been around for uh, for the longest time, I think, uh, of all the panelists here. You spent about four decades uh, in the wine industry. At some point, you would have observed that when Tamburlaine started off vis-a-vis, -vis, now it's become one of the most, uh, uh, perhaps most premium brands with respect to organics in uh, Australia. At what inflection point did you feel the need to move beyond ideology as a means to kind of take decisions and move into a more objective platform? And a follow-up question for that uh, uh, is for Clayton. You have now been associated with uh, Tamerlane for almost a decade. Uh, with respect to your expectations as a person who orchestrates all the activities in a vineyard, what what are the functional as well as economical ways that you assess a platform when you are making that choice? Uh, over to you, Mark. We, I guess we we've, we've moved we've moved into a. Uh, much bigger growth phase than I have ever thought possible. Coming from a, you know, a small kind of other company reliant entirely on cellar door sales. Much of the industry is like that. Um, it's big, it's big, it's small. I think, I think at that stage, you sort of live with the ebb and flow of what comes from the vineyard, what, what you have to sell and so on. There's been a big change and there's been a big shift in, in our company's approach. We've taken a position in the marketplace and we found that growth was inevitable. In fact, we were drawn into it. And that meant that all of a sudden, after thinking as a boutique person, I have to think as a corporate type person. And that's when some big, I used to think making a decision about thousands of dollars. Now I think making a decision about hundreds of thousands of dollars. And, and, and so ev everything we do now big consequences right through the supply chain. And, and so, um, you know, I can't say, I can't put a, a, my finger on it, but I know we've had discussions with other technology providers going back now some seven or eight years as the company started to accelerate to determine what platforms are out there, what portals are out there, and how could we use technological innovation in terms of better predicting and organising ourselves for larger and larger production, and, and certainly being much more confident of our numbers going into the, 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 the product. Now, this also came out of a period where organic grapes are, are the minority of grapes grown in Australia. So we can't go down the road Talk to our neighbour if we've got a need for Pinot Gris and just they've got an excess, buy some of those. We have to work a lot further in advance to try, try and make sure that the, we, we can try and match up demand and supply. And, and that means that the pressure and, and it brings into sharp focus to know as early in advance as you possibly can what your deficits in supply will be and then, then gives you time to turn around and look at suppliers, potential suppliers. Um, we are going through a period in Australia at the moment where there's a surplus, going to be a surplus of red grapes because of China and, and this sort of thing. But very few of those are organic. And, and so, you know, they're not, that's not really impacting our business so much. We've really got to look for what's available out there and be as well planned as we can to meet the right. expectations of our domestic and our international market opportunities. So that's happened, I guess, evolved, I can say seven or eight years since we first started thinking about it and we've never stopped thinking about it since then. So we are very pleased to see what, you know, the sort of thing that you've put together in, in the TerraView approach. Got it. Thank you. Uh, Clayton, uh, over to your part of the question. When you are evaluating platforms from a functional point of view, as well as a economical point of view, what, what were the ways that you assess working with any technology tool? Yeah, I, I guess, I guess, you know, um, the AI platforms and this um, yield estimation technologies 
probably the last five to six years, it's starting, been starting to evolve and it's probably only in the last 12 months where as a company, we've seen a little bit of an explosion in the industry where it's gone from say two or three companies, there's about eight or nine, 10 companies out there now that are involved in, in AI. So when, when we were evaluate, evaluating the companies, we did a fair bit of research between them all, including yourself. And our main focus, what we wanted to have as our, our primary objective was A, to be able to record information and B, some form of yield estimation program and tie it all in together. Uh, now, because, because our head office um, and winery is in the Hunter Valley, which is six hours away from where we're based at the acute hour winery, uh, you know, our, our meetings are all remote. Um, any information we share is by, you know, by um, usually text messages or photos. So to have the opportunity to have uh, TerraView's Vine Click app installed on our phone, which feeds back into the platform, that's greatly improved the way we can communicate with day-to-day um, -day running in the vineyards. You know, I can ring up uh, our winemaker in the Hunter Valley, I'll ring up Mark in the Hunter Valley and say, we've got an issue in one of the vineyards. Usually his response is send me a photo because he can't just jump, uh, hop in a car and drive down because that's a 12, 14 hour turnaround in a car. But if he can get onto the platform and log on and see if we've had hail damage or we've had frost damage, he can see the results of that himself without having to waste his time coming down to view it in real time. So that's the advantage we, we see of buying click, being able to record the data have that stored there at that point in the season where it's catalogued. And then next year going forward for reference points, we can look back on the previous year and compare where are we up to this year compared to last year? How far behind bud burst are we? How far, far from harvest are we? So, because we, ne we need to obviously schedule timings you know, with track, track the, um, and implements. You know, we also need to schedule staff holidays. So just those different times uh, as far as trimming, spraying and slashing heading into December, well, we can start to predict when that's going to happen and make sure we've got staff available for those times so they're not actually on leave. So can, I, can, I just, can I just add that with uh, uh, people who are in the field work, doesn't matter what level in the organisation, if they're equipped with data collection devices and that's part of their job role, your, your productivity in collecting information can be fantastically enhanced compared to now. I mean, that they all become then actively involved in the production planning of the business. This is the guy who drives the tractor, the guy who's fixing the irrigation. They're all now in, integrated into the, the planning cycle and they're providing data, real-time data all the time. So you're getting productivity out of the people, the highly paid people now. Everyone's highly paid in Australia. And, and they're all out there. They should be working and, 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 and doing more things at once to contribute to the best understanding the business has so it can optimise its opportunities. I would say, too, that I've spoken a lot about, you know, just financial, you know, sales and marketing and, and meeting those expectations as being critical to the business. But it's the quality issues like Clayton's been talking about as well. When to harvest. I mean, you, you know, you can't, you've, got, you've got to be able to react quickly. If you have a hailstorm through and there's a critical block there, you've got to make a decision. and It mightn't be so accessible straight away. So you're going to have to make the earliest decision you can possibly do. You may actually have to choose to relegate or change the purpose of those grapes to another product simply on the basis of what you can see visually quickly and then look for some other block to fulfill the need because it becomes a quality and purpose exercise. So I think these things are, they're all built into the technology that you're, you're promoting and your, your companies work so hard on. And, I, and, and obviously that, that's with that all of these things become, the more you use it, the more you find you, you could potentially benefit. Thank you so much, uh, Mark. And I think uh, a very valid point with regards to taking quick decisions, especially in light of uh, extreme weather events. Uh, we all uh, know uh, about three weeks back, the kind of uh, damage that a unseasonal hailstorm can do, uh, what we observed in Southern Australia, especially in Barossa. And it is more important now than ever to have preventive actions rather than reactive actions. And the better head start that we have, the better it is for planning the season because 
uh, once an event like that takes place, sometimes uh, a vineyard has to kind of let go of an entire vintage and that's just cruel. Uh, we also have a couple of uh, questions I think uh, Pratik uh, wanted to ask, but there are two questions from the audience for you, Pratik, which uh, I would like to combine and ask. Uh, the first question comes to us from uh, Toppers Mountain Wines, uh, where they wanted to understand a quick outline of the sources of the data that go into the yield prediction. And the second question comes from uh, Murray Cook, who wants to understand at what stage of the season uh, do all these data points come into play? Uh, you want to take that up? Yeah, sure. Uh, great question. So um, I think we, we wanted to build a very democratic system. So there is, first of all, I think uh, the stages for the time you have putt right? I think that's sort of a good time for the system to sort of start doing very, very early estimates. I mean, that's how the system essentially operates. In terms of the signals that we take, uh, we built our system in a method where minimal signals also give you high input. So let's assume we already have come pre-integrated with satellite signals giving us NDVI. Uh, we collect um, ET signals uh, on our own. And then there is obviously um, our own app, which essentially is like a ground data collection um, signal. So these three signals sort of essentially uh, are default signals for the system, and they essentially drive a significant part of our accuracy. But as a system, we we essentially integrate with all and every signal that is available or existing infrastructure that is available. So we're not limited to a signal. We come already ready with relevant signals for us to start driving intelligence. Thank you, uh, Murray and uh, Topaz Mountain Wines. Uh, I hope uh, this answered the question. Uh, but uh, over to you, Dr. Jordan, uh, Pratik, and uh, Clayton, uh, the forum's all yours, if you want to uh, compare notes across each of your presentations and if you have a point of view on uh, what each of the perspectives was, uh, I'll, I'll let you kind of uh, have an open freewheeling conversation. Maybe. Okay, I'll go for Dr. Jordan. Oh, oh yeah, thank you. <laughs> so, uh, you know, there is this this climate invariability has called for uh, greater certainty in the business, right? Whether it is yield estimates or sort of any other important matrices that are important, like Mark and Clayton have been also, especially Mark have been talking about sort of impact on it, on the financial aspects of the business. Uh, now, what's the general industry expectation around sort of uh, consistency and certainty when it comes to sort of yield estimates predictions in general? What's been your take? I take it, I think I started to indicate just the variability that exists. And I think uh, uh, Mark and Clayton also made reference to this, just how yeah, very few suppliers will be near, uh, give, provide yields with any accuracy. So there's been 10s, 20s, 30% variation around a yield estimate. And sadly, we've accepted that as being the norm. And uh, you, I, I remember one day standing in a vineyard with uh, an owner who was from the stock market, and he said, uh, if I gave financial advice with a 30% under or over estimate, I wouldn't be in the job. And so he looked at me saying, if you're going to provide me an estimate of the yield with a, a plus or minus 30%, uh, my tenure with him was relatively short. So... Uh, <laughs> But, but I was just reflecting what the experience was in the industry that plus or minus 30 percent can occur. Uh, so so that shouldn't you know, our, our demands, and I think Mark, you made mention of this too, we need much higher precision and accuracy or accuracy around those yields to be able to manage our, these businesses that are becoming more complex, the demands are much higher. and the data and the requirement for that information is not just a one-off. You know, give me a figure and we'll live with that for the whole season. That's actually continually evolve as our sales and marketing plans evolve. Uh, uh, the businesses are adapting to a changing environment. Uh, we need to continue to update and provide um, accuracy with yield estimates. Yeah, I totally agree there, Dave. And, and I think it's... It's probably more relevant, you know, we're not saying we're, we're any more special than anyone, but in the organic industry, when it comes to the death of the season and, you know, for whatever reason, the yield estimates do come in light, it's a mad scramble when we suddenly start hitting the weigh bridge to go and try and find fruit. 
organic fruit in particular, it is extremely hard to find. So, you know, the, the, the more accurate we can get yield estimates with these platforms, it, it gives us a little bit of uh, surety and a little less sleepless nights as we start to head towards vintage. Because we can, you know, if if after two, two years, three years, we can start to see the percentage accuracy getting there, then you know, it'll take a massive load off our shoulders in subsequent years moving forward because we know that the platform's working. Yep. I guess I, I had a question for Pratik, just thinking about I outlined the range of approaches that are being contemplated and developed to enable us to better understand the yield performance of vines and vineyards. For you to develop TerraView, you must have gone through and evaluated many of these pathways and, and opportunities. And I'm sort of interested to capture a bit of that history of your evaluation and then where you've ended up and why you've ended up at that point and the technology and the sources of information to feed into the yield predictions as provided by TerraView. Yeah, thank you for that question, Dr. Jordan. Yeah, there have been there've been a lot of methods, you know, that have been discussed, tested both academically as well as sort of piloted commercially to get to accurate yield estimates. Um, and all these experiments that that the wine world has seen has have been very, very honest efforts in helping solve one of the greatest challenges in the era of climate shift. Um, I can't I can't say about all, but the ones that I have I have or we saw initially had great intent, but suffered from from what I call the romance of isolation. Now, most of these experiments were done with regulated variability, whether it is of climate or grape type or, or soil type, and they were done with, with as many data signals as they could get to help the system or model take decisions. And almost all of them were one-way communications, which means the system could speak to you, but you could never report back to the system or tell it where it was going wrong or doing well. Now, there was usually sort of what we saw were systems with no feedback loop. You know, they were in isolation. And in isolation, these systems performed very well. Now, I'm aware that a lot of them were able to get high degree of accuracy in a very limited set. But the moment it was exposed to the real world of chaos, the accuracy wasn't there at all. So we believe that every acre or every hectare is unique and the data communication from the ground needs to be democratized. We believe that the system will only be healthy if it gets fresh air. And a piece of code cannot go out and take a walk. But all of us, you know, all the people on the ground, when we, we, when we walk our vineyards, we can capture information and, and feed it back to the system, keeping the estimates very, very healthy. Also, we need to, you know, to make do with what we have. So we've always designed our systems with a very minimalistic approach. We don't depend on a large set of hardware for signals. And we don't want people to spend you know, hundreds and thousands of dollars on new stuff. We just want to provide them with a tool which is independent, extremely easy to start and operate, and most importantly, has been built for chaos of today and future. So these sort of fundamental aspects of you know democratic communication, minimalistic approach, and building for chaos is how we built uh, our real estate mission feature and and the entire platform. Sure, thank you, thank you for that answer. I think probably all of us can relate to operating in chaos. Um, <laughs> what do you reckon, Mark? <laughs> Mm. Uh, it's pleasing, uh, and and I think that uh, yeah we've, we 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 suffer from. I was just thinking of also the, to add to the chaos is that there's there's a there's a relative inconsistency in people staying in any role, and and you lose the the, the loss of intellectual property out of wine businesses can be a serious problem, and, and I think that's what makes a central collection data collection point that. It has carries the history forward with it is is actually practical. It deals with the reality of um, how people change careers and move on, and you lose people. So, so I think there's a, just a logic uh, mm. beyond all, everything else to, in this crazy industry we're in, and organisational relative chaos sometimes to try and have some consistency of data that that you know intelligent. Um, uh, 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 contributors to the business subsequently can draw on, and and so the knowledge is much more obtained. Mm. Well, for all the panelists, uh, there is one interesting observation that has come in, uh, which I want to just share uh, for all of you to opine on uh, before I go into the last question. Uh, so uh, one uh, comment has come in saying, you know, plus minus thirty percent is actually 
bloody good in my experience. We've done bunch counting and weighing for the last 10 years. And even with history, it is extremely hard to get inside plus minus 25%. Uh, any thoughts on this, uh, for, especially for uh, uh, the Tamerlane team and Dr. Jordan on the basis of your last uh, many years of being in the wine industry? Uh, do you think that's an acceptable benchmark? Or is it just because it's a, it's a norm that has been established over the years? It has tended to kind of uh, being <laughs> made into acceptance. I think I think uh, uh, for Topper's Mountain, I can relate to that. Uh, I was a grape grower for 25 years, um, so I was sitting on this side of the fence. But now doing doing uh, the winery and grower liaison, I'm on this side of the fence. So I'm now at the growers going. I need some yield forecasts. Um, where are they? Oh, well, we, we'll get there next week. We'll get there next week. I'm going, but. I need the yield forecast because I need to know what we've got. If we have a shortfall, I need to go and source fruit from somewhere else. And we get to next week, where's the yield forecast? Oh, it's raining, we didn't get there. And suddenly the year's pushing forward and then all of a sudden we hit Christmas time and we start to get them drip, to dribble in. You know? Well, unfortunately for me now, that's not good enough, but I was on that side of the fence to begin with. Um, so I can I can see the, the change on why wineries now demand the yield forecast back in early November because it gives them time to go and source and plan and get ready in case there is a shortfall shortfall in those areas. We we uh, we are off, as anybody in the wine industry will attest. We're assaulted by people called salespeople. I don't know whether you know them, but they turn up. And they want to sell you stuff for vintage. They want to offer you the deal for so much tartaric acid or whatever it is. And you've got to base those purchases, particularly the bigger you get, on some, some estimation of what crop you're going to process. I mean, you can spend and commit yourself to a whole lot of French barrels that you, you aren't, you're not going to be able to use. And they're expensive. And so, you know, ultimately, a lot of planning goes into financially being successful as a winery not just dealing with the number of grapes that, you know, someone's provided you uh, under, under the circumstances, the unknown circumstances that the season's providing. So, so there's a lot of implications. As Clayton, he's finding out what it's like on this side of the fence. <laughs> and, and, I, and I think, I think you know, in, in those, those previous years when it got too wet where you just didn't get a chance to get the yieldsmiths done, you just rolled the previous years through and said, We'll run with that one and then if we need to change it we'll tweak it up as we go well on the other side of the fence now we can't have that and that's that's why TerraView's platform for us it doesn't care whether it's raining it doesn't care whether it's a sunday or a monday it'll give us the yield result here are the yield estimates on those days which is that's what we need and whether it's right or wrong now time will tell going forward but we know if we want it on the Sunday, we'll get them on the Sunday and it's done. And I'd only add oh. to that, plus or minus 30% was, uh, I think that we just didn't want to beat ourselves up too badly. So uh, there are <laughs> all in that, we all have in our memory of estimates being poorer than the plus or minus 30%. So I can understand to the question posed. And I guess, David, that, that, that's where when you're, uh, you're working with your, your stockbroker, mate, you, you turn around and say to him, there is a disclaimer down the bottom. <laughs> yep. Uh, I think the last question for today's uh, panel, I think, uh, uh, comes to you. Uh, uh, following up on that uh, note is, uh, does the AI system make an estimate of bunch numbers and sizes somehow? If not, how does it develop yield estimates? Uh, do you want to clarify on that? Yeah, I think that calls for a very sort of detailed discussion. The the, the quick answer to that would be uh, the system at the back end does a bunch number estimation and then plugs that back into the system. So we augment a lot of information. We don't do physical counting, but a lot of augmentation happens at the back end and that essentially then drives to the yield estimates. Just for everyone's understanding, the Terabyte yield estimate uh, computes 5 million data points every day to provide those estimates and those sort of data points essentially vary from weather signals to ET signals to NDVI to sort of all the other signals that come in for the graph. Mm. 
thank you. Hope uh, we were able to get uh, that point across. Uh, and if there are any questions, we'll be more than happy to kind of have an uh, in-depth conversation uh, at the end. Uh, but on that note, I think we've, uh, we're good with our time and I would like to conclude uh, today's session. Uh, thank you all for joining us today, all of our panelists for sharing their point of view. Uh, clearly, for me, the takeaway is yield estimation is a key factor to not just optimize uh, vineyard management uh, for, from a, a desired great quality point of view, but it has a direct impact on business. Uh, classical yield estimation methods have uh, you know, relied heavily on manual sampling uh, with a limited uh, uh, scope of uh, sample areas, but they're time consuming and there is, uh, there is a, a, a very imminent need for us to kind of obtain a more definitive and trustworthy intelligence data. Uh, for any thoughts and feedback, uh, please feel free to write to us. Uh, my name is Mayank, I'm on mayank at terraview.co. And if you are a grower in Australia and New Zealand, and if you'd like to try yield, uh, our yield estimation for this season, feel free to get in touch. And uh, I hope you all have a great day and a fantastic vintage ahead. Thank you so much for joining and see you all soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.